And tell God all about it. Tell the Lord all about it. I have one saying that get off the phone. You don't need to tell nobody but God. Because he's the only one that can fix it. He can fix it. Yes, he can. I know him to still be a bomb in Gilead. Nothing too hard for the Lord. That's why we're here. We're here to lift up Jesus and to give him all of the glory and all of the honor. No matter what we go through in our lives, we know that God is still in control. Amen. The scripture says, don't look to the left nor to the right, but keep your eyes stained upon him. For he is able. Yes, he's able. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Once again, God, as you look down from your throne, see us, O oh God, the way you would like for us to be, Lord God. Lord God, help us in every area of our lives, Lord God, that we might please you, O oh God, Lord God. Lord God, that we might put our trust in you this morning, Lord God. Lord, we come to worship you give you all of the glory, all of the honor, Lord God. We know that thou art a healer, Lord God. There's nothing that you cannot do. You are a God that cannot lie, Lord God. So, Lord God, we're looking for you to speak to us this morning. Give us a word, God, that we can hold on to, Lord God. Lord God, that it might purge us and keep us, Lord God in these dying times, oh Lord. Lord God, we know you can do it, oh God. We ask you to use the man of God. Lord, allow your spirit, Lord God, to come from the throne. Lord God, that the word of God would be sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord God, that it would be marrow to our bones, Lord God, that it might shake us this morning as we shake ourselves. So Lord, we thank you. And we love you, God, in all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do, Jesus. We want to give you praise. We want to give you honor. And we most of all want to give you glory because you deserve it, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving our souls and for taking care of us, Lord. We can't thank you enough for all that you do. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. We give you glory. Everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. Ushers, you can come forward and take up the Sunday morning tithes and offering. So good and so glad to see every single one of you. To all of our guests, we're so glad you're here this morning. And uh, those watching online, missionaries watching, other churches watching, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to uh, First Pro Ministry Services. Don't change that dial. Same bat time, same bat channel every Sunday morning. You check us out, all right? Amen. Why do we take up the offering? It's not because we take vacations or buy cars with us. This is what we do to help pay for the light bill. Uh, we have uh, gas bills, and just like everything else in your house, we have to pay for things like this. When the plumbing goes down, it has to be repaired. This is what we do, and this is why we all pitch in to help out so we have such a beautiful facility, facility to uh, worship in and raise up the name of Jesus. So this is why we do it, and so it is a blessing to you, and it will be a blessing to you when the Lord blesses you for your giving. Lord, we thank you so much for the chance to give to you because we enjoy giving to you, Lord, because you always take care of us. You always bless us, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to uh, use this money for your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to go over some uh, announcements very quickly here. We have a uh, Tuesday morning prayer at 9 a.m., and then when Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, we have the Wednesday evening prayer. Right after that will be the uh, Wednesday evening youth service, okay? Everybody is invited. It's not just for the youth. Everybody's invited to this. That starts at 7 o'clock. Then Thursday is the youth, uh, youth uh, game night. That starts at 7. That's right here. And then uh, Friday evening is the revival rally. That's also to everybody that wants to come. That's going to be right here at Firstborn Ministries. And that starts at 7.30 p.m. So that's Friday night. So everybody's invited Wednesday night for some youth service. Everybody's invited to the youth rally on Friday night. And then Saturday evening in Mendota, starting at 5 o'clock, we're going to have the continuation of the youth rally. That will be in Mendota. That starts at 5 o'clock. You are invited to that also. Okay. Now, we have a men's conference coming up on September 15th and the 16th. Okay. The cost is $10 for that. Uh, you can see Sister Heather about it, or you can register online to do that. So, Man, we encourage you to come. If you can't make it Friday night, you can make it Saturday. Or if you can't make it Saturday, come Friday night. At least come to one of those. You will enjoy it. Brother Pepper is going to be with us. Amen. Sitting right back there. And our own pastor, Brother Maynard, is going to be there. You're going to enjoy that. That's right. So be sure and sign up for that. Okay. Now, uh, let me see what else I got here. I'm getting old, so I can't see things. Oh, no service tonight. We have a picnic going on. That's right. Yeah, give me another woo. Who did that? Give me another one. All right. I like that. Okay. Church picnic. We do this. This is fun. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, we got people that's bringing all their good stuff. And, and please, I beg someone, please bring liver and onions for Pastor Maynard just for him. That's his favorite. He enjoys that. And if you can, bring a six-pack of Tab. That's his favorite drink also, okay? I don't know how any of you ladies... When I was a kid growing up, when they were on a diet and they are trying to find a man, they drank Tab because that way they could eat a candy bar and it evens out. You know what I'm saying? Tab was the worst drink you could ever drink in your life. Amen. I mean, it came, even the pink in it was ugly. So thank goodness they came up with Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi. But if you come, please come tonight. That starts at 5 o'clock. Uh, become and enjoy yourself. Bring a football, bring a, a baseball or something. Enjoy yourself. A Frisbee, whatever. Some people even bring their dogs. Okay? Make sure they're nice. I have a mean dog. Bring, bring a nice dog, okay, so we don't bite anybody, okay? But we are so glad that all of you come. We're going to return back to the service. Sister Abby, are you ready? If, if I am, listen to her. Okay, let's go. Thank you. 
I'm glad he's risen this morning, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Why don't you take a moment and shake hands with a few folks around you um, and let them know you're glad that they're here on this Labor Day weekend holiday. Amen. We're so glad that you're here. The youth class can be dismissed. We pray that they have a great class today. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. I'm glad I'm here as well. Before we go any further in prayer, uh, this past week, our nation, or some of the members of our nation, specifically those in uh, southern South Texas, they were devastated by Hurricane Harvey. And I'm not sure that we prayed for that today or not, but um, our hearts go out to all of these men and women, several churches are displaced and people have uh, really no place to go. Uh, they were struggling, scrambling in order to try to put clothes together. One church I read about, they said that they pitched a tent and they planned on beginning uh, tent services that were going to be ongoing. And they said this perhaps could be the longest tent <laughs> revival that they've ever had because... Uh, uh, because of the water and the devastation that had taken place. Uh, one specifically who is very close to our heart is Brother Jeff Sanders, who is in Orange, Orange, Texas. Uh, some of his family attend church here. He is a pastor, and uh, uh, they were put out of their house, and the church had gotten water in it as well. I watched video clips of um, the terrible plight that these people are going through, and my heart goes out to them. Um, and then I, I watched as our president uh, flew there and, and stood with these people and told them that we will do all that we can to be able to help them. I saw a side of him that was a softer side than we have seen in, in times past, which was very, very refreshing to me. And then he did something that I, I thought America has needed for a long time, and that is this. He called for today, Sunday, to be a day of prayer for our nation and so we agree with him we agree with him so we want to pray that God would touch those that are displaced that God would minister to them and help them and we're going to try and send uh, from our church uh, monies to help uh, Brother Sanders and if you'd like to give to that I felt like the Lord placed it on our heart to try and help these people if you'd like to give that you can just designate give it to the church and we will be sending that to them. So Brother Sanders, Sister Sanders, if you're watching this morning, we love you and we love all of the people that are in South Texas and we pray that God's hand would just help you through this difficult time. Let's pray for all of these people, can we? Father, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for hearing us and, and being a present help in time of need. We don't understand everything that comes our way and Lord, we don't even like everything that comes our way. 
Sometimes we pray for one thing and another thing happens, Lord, and we struggle with those times. But, Lord, we never struggle with the fact that uh, uh, what you said is true. Lord, we may struggle embracing that, but we know that you are never going to deceive us. You will never lie to us. And, Lord, you always have our best interest at heart. Lord, you always do all things well is what the Word says. And I pray for these men and women that have been displaced by this, uh, this hurricane and the flooding. I pray for all of those people that are there, the people in Houston. God, that you would help the mayors, the, the councilmen, the, the leaders, the, the church uh, pastors that are leaders in that community. And all of the people, I pray that you would help them to see that we are indeed one nation, indivisible, under God with liberty and justice for all. Lord, I pray that this would bring us closer together as a nation. I pray, God, that our hearts would be warmed and that, that our, our pocketbooks would be opened up. And, Lord, that we would speak words of, of hope and help, not only in prayer, but, God, that we would speak to them as well. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for helping them to rebuild and to see that, uh, that it's going to be all right. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless these people. Amen. Amen. During World War II, a United States Marine was separated from his unit on a Pacific island. The fighting had been intense and the smoke and the crossfire had caused him to lose touch with his comrades. Alone in the jungle, he could hear enemy soldiers coming his direction. Scrambling for cover, he found his way up a high ridge to several small caves in the rock. Quick, quickly, he crawled inside one of the caves, safe for a moment. He realized that once the enemy soldiers began to look for him, sweeping the ridge where he was at, checking all of the caves, that they would find him and he would be killed. So he waited and he prayed. Have you, have you ever waited and prayed? You knew what was going to happen, and you prayed that God would cause it not to happen. And this was his prayer, Lord, if it be your will, please protect me. Whatever your will, though, I love you, I trust you, I believe you, and I accept that. In Jesus' name, amen. After praying, he lay quietly, listening to the enemy begin to draw closer and closer. He thought to himself, well, I guess the Lord is not going to hear me on this. He's not going to answer my prayer. Just then he saw a spider as it began to weave a web. And I'll leave you there for a moment. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelation of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out, I don't know. I can't tell. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words that were not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities, my difficulties, my sickness, my challenges. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, everybody say that. For this thing, say it with me again. For, say it again. I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Read with me verse number nine. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
My subject this morning, just for a moment, the spider web. Say it with me, would you? The spider web. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. All of us here today have had prayers in our lives that have been answered exactly the way that we have prayed them, haven't we? Is there anyone here that has had a prayer answered in your life? If so, raise your hand and say amen. amen. Every single one of us. And I'm truly thankful for those times of answered prayer. As a small child, a pr- child would maybe pray for a broken toy or pray that they would get something. And in times, though, that uh, it might seem insignificant to many others, the Lord would see that and he would answer that prayer. And then there are the times in adults' lives when there are tremendous needs and we have prayed about it and God answered that prayer. Perhaps not like that, but maybe it was eventually. Maybe it was after a time. The fact is that God answers prayers. God hears us when we pray. God wants to hear us when we pray. There are times, however, when it seems like our prayers are not answered. There are times when it feels as though God did not hear me. Perhaps you're here today and you say, well, that's never happened to me then. Perhaps you have not been living for the Lord very long then. Because if you've lived for the Lord any length of time, you will discover that there will be times when it seems like the heavens are brass, as the Old Testament says, and God does not hear the prayer that you're praying. We look into the Word of God in Solomon, the wise man, in the Old Testament, the wisest man that we find in the Word of God. He said these words, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself, speaking about his distance, it seemed, from God. And he was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Have you ever been there when you've called upon God and God did not give you an answer? You sought him, but it seems like there were no doors that were, that were open to you. So the question begs an answer. Why won't God answer my prayer? Why are these times like this? Allow me to give you a few reasons or just a couple reasons today why I believe our prayers are not answered as they should be. First of all, prayers are not answered because they are never prayed. God cannot and will not answer a prayer that you never prayed because he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to ask him. James said it this way, you have not because you ask not. You see, sometimes we do not receive from the Lord because we don't ask him for those things that that we need. And sometimes I'm convinced that once we ask him, we continue, 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 asking, 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 and we forget about just leaving it in the hands of God and then trusting him to do everything that is right. James again said, you have not because you ask not. It's not wrong to ask God. As a matter of fact, he wants you to ask him. Second of all, uh, prayers are not answered because we are praying with the wrong motives or we are praying with the wrong ideas or the wrong uh, uh, attitude. James again says in James 4 and 3, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. The word amiss there is taken from the Greek word which means out of place. In other words, you're asking, but your asking is out of place. It means wrong motives. You're asking, but you have the wrong motives for asking. Or uh, finally, that you are asking for the wrong things. Yes, you are praying, but you are praying for the wrong things. You're praying for the things that that, uh, you want and ignoring God speaking to you in that time of prayer. I have discovered that prayer is not just about us asking God what we want. But prayer is first and foremost about listening to what God is saying and then hearing what God is saying and then agreeing with God by praying what God has said. It is then that prayers get answered. Sometimes if we're not careful, we're like that uh, little boy who said, Lord, this is Jimmy. Let me tell you what I want you to give me. And we all, we, we, we just are, it's all about give me this and give me that. But prayer again is all about finding the will of God And then once you find the will of God, then praying that, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I've heard people make many statements in prayer that seem to be holding God for ransom. They would say things like, if the Lord doesn't answer this prayer, then I'm going to do this. As though we can manipulate God or we can control God 
or, because, or that God is threatened. A little boy was overheard saying his prayers one day, and he prayed this way, Lord, you know I've been a good boy. Then he thought for a moment, and he realized he wasn't as good as he said he was. And then he said, Lord, you know I've been trying to be a good boy. Then he thought again, and he realized that wasn't even true because he wasn't trying to be a good boy. And then he remembered there was a little figurine of what his mother said was Mary that sat on the fireplace mantle. He went and got that figurine, and he looked up to God, and he held that little figurine to his chest, and he said, Lord, if you ever want to see your mother again, you better answer my prayer. And we laugh at that, and we realize that that is ridiculous, and that is the child's way of doing things, and yet we do sometimes the very same things. We try to hold God hostage in order to get him to answer our prayers. And the truth is that God does not want us to hold him hostage. He does not have to have his arm twisted behind his back, but he wants to answer them according to his will. Prayer is not bribing God into doing something he does not want to do. But when we have that attitude, our motives are less than pure, and our prayers will be hindered in that time. I remember a man several years ago that he wanted a wife so badly. He wanted to be married so bad that in his desperation, he said, God, if you don't send me a wife today or tomorrow or whatever the time was, next week, next month, then I will stop serving you. Are you surprised that God did not answer his prayer? God did not listen to him. And a month from that time that he prayed that prayer, guess what? He was still as single as he could be. And God did not hear that prayer. Aren't you glad, though, that the Lord doesn't answer our prayers, uh, some of our prayers? Aren't you glad that sometimes God just turns a deaf ear and he says, no, I'm not going to hear that. I'm not going to answer that. I wonder what would have happened if the Lord would have answered his prayers by sending him the worst possible wife that he could have ever had. I wonder if he would have been satisfied after that. I wonder if there is such a thing, if he would have gone to the mail order bride catalog and he would have gone to the Hades section and said, this is going to be your wife. You're going to have a bride from Hades Amen. And there you go. I've answered your prayer. Later, he would have said, I wish the Lord would not have answered my prayer. Sometimes I am thankful that God has not answered my prayer. You say, you are, pastor? Yes, because I was praying for the wrong thing. Have you ever prayed for the wrong thing? Have you ever asked God for something and the Lord's was not his will for that to happen? And uh, when the Lord didn't do it, you got mad, you got upset, and you said, why God? You said you would answer my prayer. Well, sometimes uh, later on, we realize that that was the best thing for us to do. Remember Elisha in a low time of his life? The Bible says that he prayed a prayer while he was all alone in a cave. And you remember what his prayer was? His prayer was, God, just let me die. I've got to believe that later on, whenever his life began to turn around, he was so thankful that God did not answer his prayer and that God did not take his life. There are some prayers, however, that are answered that are really negative for us. There are some things that the scripture teaches us you can ask God for so much and so long for that he will just finally say, fine, go ahead and have at it. One of the examples of that is found in Israel. Israel had a prayer, they prayed a prayer at one time that, that they wished to God he had not answered for many, many years. The prayer was this, God give us a king like all of the other nations. And when the Lord said, no, I want to be your king, they pressed him, they persisted, Lord give us a king. Until finally the Lord gave them a king and the Bible says that God granted leanness into their soul. Or in other words, they were going to suffer many problems in that nation for many, many years. Again, I'm thankful for the prayers that God has answered on my behalf. But I'm more thankful for the prayers that God has not answered. Which introduces the next thought uh, for your consideration. What about unresolved conflicts in our prayers? Sometimes our prayers are not answered because we have unresolved conflict in our life. Did you know that if you live life longer than a week or so and you get around people, you're going to have conflict in your life. Somebody said, well, I just want to get married and I want to live happily ever after. <laughs> That's a great, great ideological, philosoph philosophical, um, 
impossibility, right? <laughs> You're going to have conflicts in your life. You're going to have conflicts every place that you go. You see, our interpersonal relationships are a very important element to our answered prayer. God wants your relationship with others, with your family, with those that you are around to be good. And when they're not as good as they need to be and we have unresolved conflicts, that becomes a stop sign for our prayers to be answered. I'm convinced that many prayers have been put on hold because of unresolved conflicts in the hearts and the lives of men and women. When I talk about conflict, I'm talking about when we come into collision or disagreement, uh, to be in opposition, to have strife then over those things, and then to continually contend or fight about that, to do battle, to have controversy. I'm not saying you have to agree with everybody about everything. Somebody asked uh, folks that come to this church, they said, do you believe everything that the pastor teaches and, uh, and preaches? Uh, and do you, uh, do you think that all of that, that, do you come in alignment with them? They said, no. They said, well, why do you go there? They said, because, number one, we love God. Number two, there are so many more things that we do agree on that we don't agree on. That's why I go there. And number three, I feel the presence of God in that house. <laughs> Amen. And so what we have to do is we have to refuse to major upon the things that we disagree upon. You might disagree as to when the Lord is going to come back. You might disagree as to uh, how many uh, years there it took in creation or whether it was seven literal days. You might disagree on many things in the scripture. Was it wine, actual uh, intoxicating wine that Jesus turned the water into? Or no, it absolutely was not. You see, those things you have an opinion on, and that's fine if you have an opinion on that, but you have to make up your mind that you are not going to fight and fuss and quarrel and be conflicted in these areas. And if there is conflict in these areas, you have got to seek to resolve that conflict because God wants you to be at peace with one another. Somebody say amen. Listen to what Jesus said about this. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 23. Then verse 24 says, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and be reconciled there unto thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. This whole passage deals with right relationships. It deals with making sure that our relationship with one another is correct and that we are treating one another the way that God wants want us to treat one another. He says, if you remember a conflict, you remember an issue that you have when you're praying, stop your praying. And then go and make it right between your brother, between your sister, so that your prayers will be maximized before God. You want your prayers to be the greatest that they can be, the most powerful that they can be? Then resolve the conflicts in your life. It might be a conflict that you have between you and your boss, and you said some things that you shouldn't have said, or he said some things that he shouldn't have said to you, and now you hold that in your heart against him. You need to go to that man and that, or that woman, whoever it is, and you need to resolve that. You say, well, what if they don't say, I'm sorry? So what? You've done what you're supposed to do. You've done your best to resolve that. And if you'll do that, God will bless you and he will answer your prayers. Your prayers will become more powerful. Sometimes the conflict is not with others, but sometimes the conflict is right within our own family. You ever seen conflict in a family? You ever seen husbands and wives get into conflicting times? I've been to houses where uh, the dishes were thrown and pots and pans were thrown. I was in a house one day, and I walked there. I, I, I came there. It was late at night to try and help this uh, young couple to resolve their differences. And I walked in, and she was on one side of the room, and he was on the other side of the room. And I stood there away from the woman because, quite frankly, I was a little concerned she was going to slap me. And uh, you, say, you say, Pastor, come on, you're, you're prejudiced. No, I'm, I'm just realistic. And I was there. You wasn't there. I was there. All right? So I don't have anything against women or anybody. I, you know, that's, I don't. But I was smart enough to know to stand across the room. And as I was trying to resolve this situation, he said something that she did not like. And brother, 
the pan that was next to her flew across the room and I went like that. Bang! It came up against the wall and I thought, if I ever needed the Lord before, I sure do need Him now. <laughs> Amen. I need Him right now. And so the conflict in your family will hinder your prayers. How can you get a prayer answered from God when you're fussing and cussing each other every other day? How can you get a prayer answered from God when you are telling your husband all of, the, all of the things that you hate about him and that you dislike about him and you're working against him instead of working with him? How can you have your prayers answered whenever you are doing the same to your wife? Whether you're a man or woman, God wants us to learn to treat one another with great kindness and respect. Listen to the word of God. 1 Peter 3 and 7 says, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with your wife according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. He says, this is the reason why you want to do this. This is the reason why you want to treat your wife correctly, gentlemen. This is the reason why that you want to give honor to them. This is the reason why you treat them as the weaker vessel. Not because they're weaker minded or they're weaker in that sense. But one version put it this way. Treat her as a fine piece of china. China is fragile. China has to be handled very carefully. And so this is what Simon Peter was saying. Be careful how you treat your wife. Honor her. Dwell with her according to knowledge that your prayers be not hindered and that you may be heirs of the grace of life, that you might experience the very best that life can have to offer. When I think about this passage, to dwell with knowledge, I believe that it means to live with an understanding so that you create a harmony and a unity inside of that home. This means that you have studied that wife well. This means that you understand what makes them happy or what makes them upset. Now, I realize that, that wives can make the house a, either a, a, a place of dilemma or a place of delight, but I believe that the husband has the greater responsibility in order to bring peace inside of that home. You as the headship, you as the leader in that home, doesn't mean that you're the jefe, or in Spanish that means the boss. That means that you are the leader. And as the leader, you lead that lady. You don't lord over her, but you help her. And you minister to her, you care for her, and as you do so, she understands he has my best interest at heart. Well, the Bible says to dwell with them to live with them in such a way that there is harmony and unity. This means you have studied them well and you understand what makes them happy or what makes them mad. Sadly enough, many spouses have a master's degree in understanding what makes your wife mad. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. And yet, barely a K-4 when it comes to understanding what makes them happy. We need to reverse that. We need to have a master's degree when it comes to knowing what makes them happy and how to treat them so that they can be all that God wants them to be. Peter, he said this, give them honor. Husbands as the weaker vessel, honor them. Not inferior, not weaker, but treat them as a fine piece of crystal. Being careful not to damage them by your gruff words or your actions. Why? Because you're the heirs of the grace of life. Everything life has to offer, you share together and enjoy when things are right in your life. So he says, be careful that your prayers be not hindered. Now the word hindered there is taken from the Greek word enkopto. It means to cut in two. It means to put an obstacle in one's path. This word is used to describe the discouragement of a person's travel by breaking up the road that they travel on, thereby detaining them and preventing them from reaching their destination. So what does that mean to us when we pray? When our relationships are not right, when there is unresolved conflict, it breaks up the road of, uh, that we are on, sending our prayers to God so that the prayers do not reach God as they should. They don't have the impact as they should. And the question that I have this morning to all of us, what destinations in our prayer life have not been reached because of wrong spousal relationships? 
What prayers have been unanswered or hindered because of unresolved conflict? Husbands, how is your relationship with your wife? Are you honoring them? And before you answer that, amen, think about it. Do you value them? And before you answer that, think about that. Because some would say, oh, yes, absolutely. I am a terrific husband. I am the best husband that ever was. Somebody said that if you could uh, uh, buy a husband for what he's worth and sell him for what he thinks he's worth, you'd be a millionaire. <laughs> and so the question is this. Am I that, that person that God wants me to be? Am I a good husband? And so you say... I am. All right, now let me ask your wife. What does your wife say? If her answer is not consistent with yours, you may need to reevaluate your opinion of yourself. And you may need to pay attention at to what she is saying, that your prayers be not hindered. The altar is open. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. All right. Sometimes we have conflict with God. We have conflict with others. We have conflict with our spouses. Some of you are just sitting here like, come on, the pressure's off now. All right. We're going to move on to the joy of the Lord is our strength. <laughs> Amen. But sometimes our conflict is not with our spouse. Sometimes our conflict is not with others. But sometimes our conflict is with God. Are you here today and you have a conflict with God? God is not answered my prayer like I wanted him to answer my prayer. God, you have let me down. God, you have not done what I thought you should do. The Bible teaches us that when we have conflict with God, then it's hard for us to have our prayers answered. Listen to Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. And God said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Is there anybody here that God has shut up heaven in your life? Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, and I send pestilence among my people. Has God allowed pestilence to come to your life and devour the things that are around you? Has he allowed that? And you're looking at that and you're saying, God, you could have prevented that. You could have kept that from happening. You have conflict with God. Listen to what God says. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God says, resolve the conflict you have with me and I will answer your prayers. Sometimes our prayers are not answered because we have prayed one way and God has said, I'm going to answer it another way. This was the case in our text this morning. The Bible says that Paul sought the Lord in 2 Corinthians 12. And he said, Lord, I want you to heal me of this thorn in the flesh, this infirmity in my flesh. And the Bible says that Paul talked about all of the things that God had shown him. He said, I've had visions, I've had revelation, I've, I've had great things happen to me. He said, even to a place where 14 years ago I, uh, I, I was taken into the third heaven and I saw things that my mouth could not explain, I, my tongue could not describe. And he said, I don't know if I was dead or if I was alive. Some people believe that that was a time that Paul was stoned and he was drug outside of the city and left for dead. They believe that he actually died and God took him to that, that place called paradise, heaven, and showed him the glory that was there. And then Paul, with all of that revelation, God began to use him. And yet Paul was used by God and Paul was, had shortcomings. He was broken in his own life. Do you feel as though that God can't use you because you're broken? Are you here today and you say, that's me, I'm broken. God can't use me. God can't use anything that's broken. Well, that's not the case at all. Paul was broken in the sense that he had this thorn in the flesh. And he said, Lord, I, I sought you three times and I asked that you would take this away from me. He said, it's a messenger of Satan to buffet me. That's what I view it as. 
And the Lord said, I'm not going to do it. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, will I glory in my infirmities, my shortcomings, my challenges, my sickness, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see it? Paul said, Lord, would you take this away? And the Lord says, no. Because that thing that you think makes you weak is the thing that makes you depend upon me. And it makes you strong. If I were to take that away, you would be exalted above measure and and you would get prideful and so no I'm going to leave that in your life does that mean God couldn't have done that no it doesn't God could have but God says no I have another plan he says I have another plan some have asked what that thorn in the flesh was I believe it was twofold myself number one I believe it was his poor eyesight Remember when he was saved on the road to Damascus, the Bible says that he was struck down and he was blinded for three days and he was led into the city because he could not see. And then after three days, then came Ananias, he prayed for him and the Bible says that he received his sight, he received the Holy Ghost and he was baptized and he began his ministry. There are many Bible expositors which believe that Paul's eyesight, though it was restored, was not completely restored. I believe that to be true myself. Many passes seem to lend credibility to that theory by implying that Paul was accompanied everywhere he went with somebody. And even in the Word of God, you'll find that Paul only signed one of the letters that he had had written. They were not written by his hand. And uh, the reason why is because they were penned by somebody else because he could not see to be able to write them. But in Galatians chapter 6 and 11, he said, You see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. Somebody said, well, why did he say that? Why why did he say it's a large letter? Because he couldn't see. So he's writing large. What greater glory could God get than to use a man that had poor eyesight? History says he had a high voice. He had a humped back. Even Paul said, my speech is contemptible. And in bodily presence, I am weak. But when he opened his mouth to speak, there was the power of God. And when he prayed for those that were ill, they were healed. Even to the place where handkerchiefs were taken from him and they were laid upon the sick and the Bible says God wrought healings by Paul the Apostle. And yet, he had this challenge in his own life. How many remember a blind brother Bustard that came to church here years ago? The man could not see at all. I still remember his wife leading him up to the front of this, uh, of, of this platform. He didn't read the Bible. He, he had to memorize what he was going to read from because he couldn't see. And he stood there without a Bible, stood there just trying to feel after what God would do. He would read his text and he would preach. And then he would begin to minister to the people that were there. I still very vividly remember one night, Sister Jane Darnell. She was suffering with a tumor at the base of her, of her, uh, of her uh, skull. It was attached to her brain. And uh, this man was praying for the sick. And here comes Jane. I didn't say anything to this man about anything in the church. And as he prayed for this woman, he laid his hands upon her, her, understanding he could not see. But he looked, and though he could not see with his physical eyes, he was able to see into the spirit realm. And God spoke to this man, and he said to her, he said, you have a tumor in your head. And when he said that, I'm like, whoo, glory to God. And he said, God is healing that tumor right now. And God healed her of that tumor. And from that day until the day that she passed away, the doctor said she did not have that tumor in her head. God is a healer. God is a healer. And yet I could ask the question, why didn't God heal the eyes of blind Brother Bustard? I don't know. Except for the fact that perhaps the reason why is because when he prayed for others and they were healed, 
they would know that the power was not in him because if it was, he would have healed himself. And God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Are you willing to take that from God? Are you willing to accept that? We have, all of us have some kind of a limitation in our life. All of us do. You say, not me, I, I'm good at everything. No, you're not. All of us have limitations, and yet when we realize that limitation that we have in our life never prevents God from using us. The second thing that I think was a thorn in his flesh to the Apostle Paul was, was um, the fact that he had poor choices in times past. I believe I'm speaking to men and women today that can identify with that. Paul was a persecutor of the church. He violently persecuted the church, killing many of the Christians because of their faith in God. And though he desired for those things to be erased from his mind, I believe that that could have been what Paul was praying about. Lord, I've got this thorn in my flesh. It's a messenger for sa from Satan. What's the messenger saying? You remember what you did? You remember how you failed God? You remember how you killed men and women? And now you say you're a Christian? You hypocrite. You are such a hypocrite. Lord, would you please take that away? Because he's absolutely correct. That is what I did. And yet the Lord said, no, I'm not going to take it away. Listen to Paul as he mourns the fact that he wished he could get over those things. He said in Acts 22 and 4, I can almost hear the, the mournful weeping in his voice. As he said, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Acts 26 and 11, I punished them oft in every synagogue. I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. 1 Corinthians 15 and 9, he says, I am the least of the apostles. Then I'm not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. Whatever his thorn in the flesh was, he viewed it as a messenger from Satan. And he wanted to be free. So he prayed not once, not twice, but three times. God, would you take this away? And the Lord said, no. Your pain has purpose. And your handicap will be used to bring many to hope in me. Someone once said, when you're in a dark time, Listen for the voice of God because it will be a message for someone when you come back into the light. Consider the many people that he helped, the many that could identify with him because he had his challenges. Now, if God could do that with Paul, think about your own challenges. Some of you walked in here today with your head held down and your lip is dragging the ground. And your emotions are even lower than that because you say, I've failed. I'm a failure. And the Lord is saying, hey, take your eyes off of your failure. And though I will not take away the memories of those things that you've done, I will, I will help you to rise above that and use you in spite of that. Anybody ever hear of Johnny Erickson Tata? Johnny Erickson Tata is a well-known painter and songwriter and singer. She has proof that God can take the worst of situations and use them for good. She, as a young lady, 18 years old, was uh, in a diving accident. She was a, uh, an Olympic diver. And she dove into the pool. And when she did, she failed to negotiate it properly. She struck her head on the bottom of the pool. And immediately, she became a paraplegic. She was, she was a paraplegic immediately. I'm sure there were many prayers of healing. God raise her up. God heal her. And it would have been a great miracle. It would have been a great thing to see a physical healing. But God didn't answer that way. But God says, Johnny, I'm going to take this challenge that you have. And I'm going to use you in spite of that. Each year she speaks to thousands and thousands of people that need hope and encouragement. She paints with a paintbrush between her teeth. And it's beautifully done. And she sings like an angel. 
Shall I talk to us about our own Alan Oggs, who has been here two or three times? He was a man that suffered with CP. Couldn't talk real plain. And he would call me and he'd say, Brother Maynard, still hear his voice. Can I come preach for you? If you let me come preach, I'll give you a hamburger. <laughs> I laugh and I say, Brother Ox, you don't have to give me a hamburger. Come on, preach. We love you here. You remember him? Some of you have been around long enough to remember him, remember? And he got up and he would preach. And as a young man, he said there were many prayers offered for healing. And that he even questioned, God, why didn't you answer? But when he was 18, he found that, all right, Lord, if I don't get healed of this, I'm going to live in spite of it. And there was a man by the name of Landry that he found favor with who was very wealthy. And he said, Alan, I want to send you to, the, to college. Whatever you want to do, I'm going to put you through college. I'm going to pay for everything. And so Alan, he had been talking to God. And he said, sorry, he says, I want to be a preacher. And he said, Landry laughed at him and said, Alan, you can't preach. You can barely talk. And Alan Oggs, though, went on to become one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. Amen. He did. He did. He was a great preacher. He's passed on now. This guy traveled the world, was heard internationally on Focus on the Family, and he wrote a book, You've Got to Have the Want to. I can still hear Reverend Oggs as he stood on this platform and he told the story of learning to ride his bicycle. And in his own voice, he shouted, Bicycle! I'm going to ride you, Bicycle! And ride the bicycle he did, my friend. But not just the bicycle, he rode life to its fullest. In this case, the prayer that was not answered the way that he wanted it to, and healing was not given the way he thought it should be, because of that disability, God took him all over the world, and he saved, or he was the responsible one for seeing many people saved. What is it in your life today that you prayed to get rid of and to have removed? What is it that you just said, if I could just get this straightened out, then, 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 then. You just need to get rid of the thens and say, if I never get this straightened out, I'm going to. No matter what, I'm going to. You can just, we can just sit where we are and we can say, oh, if I, you know, it needs to be better. All of us need to be better. Come on, settle it. All of us need to be better. But you'll never get... You'll, you'll never get so bad that you need to withdraw yourself from talking to God and the things of God. Just get in there and do it. Resolve the things that need to be resolved. As a man waited and he prayed, the U.S. Marine that is, God, maybe you're not going to answer my prayer today. Suddenly he saw that spider as he began to weave his web. He said, terrific, God. I prayed for deliverance and you sent a spider. The spider he watched and weaved and weaved and weaved and weaved and weaved until finally the whole opening of that little cave entrance that he went into was covered with a spider web. The soldiers finally got to where that U.S. Marine was hiding. He held his breath, stayed real still and said, all right, here it comes. They're coming in and they're going to kill me. And he said, as they came there, one of them looked down and they said, oh, there's nothing in there. Because a spider web is weaving, a spider is weaving his web across the front of this cave. And so they didn't bother looking. And the man lived to tell the story. Here's my point God might not answer your prayer the way that you want it to be answered, but God will always answer your prayer. And when He does, amen, you need to be willing to say, He does all things well. I accept it, Lord. I embrace it. You say, you're just blaming God. No, I'm rejoicing in that God that has heard my prayers. Lord, if you say no, thank you, Jesus. You know this was the best thing for me. If you say yes, thank you, Jesus, because you knew this was the best thing for me. But Lord, I'm going to believe that you answer prayer. 
I'm going to believe when I call upon your name, something happens. Amen. Because it in fact does. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's raise our hands and give God praise. Father, I thank you today. I thank you because you're a prayer answering God. I thank you that in spite of our challenges, in spite of my difficulty, in spite of my infirmity, in spite of my thorn in the flesh, you are God. And you can use me, you can use every man, every woman, in spite of all of those things. Lord, help us to remove our focus from the flesh and the thorn in the flesh to the God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. For Lord, you're the God that can do the most with the least. Lord, when all you had was dirt and some spit, you mixed the two of them together and you caused a man to see when it was applied to his eyes. Lord, when you had the least of men and women, you had a cursing fisherman, you took that man And Lord, though he denied you and though he said he didn't know you, Lord, you used him anyway because he gave himself to you and he became the spokesman for the church. Lord, you're so good that in the beginning when there was nothing, you took nothing and you made everything from. And Lord, we are something today. And if you could take nothing and make everything from, you can make something that we are. And maybe not all that we need to be, but Lord, you can use us and you can do exactly what you want to do. And so that's what I'm thanking you for today, Lord. The God that can take something and he can make it sufficient. The God that answers our prayers in Jesus' name. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Let's just give God some praise this morning at the end of this service. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Oh, I praise you, Lord. Lord, help me to resolve any conflict in my life that should not be there. there. Help me, Lord, to find a place of, of giving all of my challenges to you, Lord. Help me to comprehend that, that you using me does not depend on me being perfect and everything being in alignment. But, Lord, it depends on me trusting you. And so we come and trust you today, Lord. I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. Hallelujah. Though the cost be great.